Welcome everybody to today's live stream and today is going to be a little bit more meta than previous ones. Uh, we're not interviewing a guest, but I'm going to give you guys a studio tour, show you guys how we run the show, talk about why we do this show and what you can expect from the live stream in the future. And after that, I'm also going to jump into some product previews, uh, not reviews, but uh, previews of what you guys can expect uh, on the channel in the coming weeks. Lots of cool things like this guy. This is a uh, Western rod, but it collapses like a Tenkara rod. And it's by a brand called Rayer Garrett. And I took this fishing the other day. I'll let you guys know what my experiences were with that, as well as some cool new little bags from uh, our friends over at Reload. Uh, we had them on the live stream a couple of, uh, I think two weeks ago. And I mentioned that I ordered some bags from them and they finally came in. So talk about that. Uh, what else do we have on here? As well as uh, just some other things on the channel. I've been considering doing some actual classes either on the channel or on Skillshare. So just want to bounce that off you guys and see what you think. Um, sweet. So with all that said, let's uh, give you guys a tour of the gear. If everything is looking good, uh, just let me know. Uh, again, I can bring up your comments. Uh, so feel free to, to chat and I'll try to monitor things as uh, things are happening. Okay, so T-Track, looks like everything is going okay. Uh, Yaharia Faria, uh, it's not the little chumpy. It's actually uh, a bag called the Kitchen Sink, which I think is pretty interesting. It's like a seat bag that's a little bit bigger than the little roadie bag, but uh, not as big as a full-on bikepacking bag. But before we get into that stuff, let me give you guys a tour of our live stream, quote unquote, studio. And I'm going to start off with kind of the, the, the guts of um, the, the, whole the whole studio here. And that is uh, the camera. So, Laura, you're in the shot if you sit there. <laughs> so, <laughs> once again, it is live. <laughs> so... This is a, a shot of kind of the, 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 the main piece of equipment that makes this stuff possible. And that's a camera. And on top of that is this thing called a you know, video monitor, if you're not familiar with uh, video gear. And this second camera is actually uh, on a camcorder. So I can zoom in like old school uh, 80s home videos. So <laughs> what do you think of that? Um, so the camera I use or, or that I've been using for the channel for almost the last three years is uh, the Lumix GH5. It's micro four thirds, and it's just an amazing uh, video camera. And, you know, I didn't really use it for live streaming until COVID, you know, happened maybe once or twice before that, but definitely once, you know, we were being locked down and we couldn't travel and we couldn't ride bikes, um, you know, I decided to go a little bit more all in and, you know, figure out how to pull this off. Uh, you'll notice, here's a little camcorder remote, uh, a bunch of little cables coming out of there, and you'll, the the one on the right is actually an audio cable, the 3.5 millimeter one, and that goes uh, back to me via this wireless uh, road transmitter. Um, on top of the camera, let's talk about that for a bit. Uh, that's the uh, Blackmagic Video Assist. Uh, it's on loan for me to just try out and see if I, I like it, and it's Something I didn't think uh, I needed, you know, just because I was used to just staring at the back of the the small GH5. But after having used it, it's such it's such a luxury. It's, it's really clear, uh, really bright. You can use it to pull focus. It's got focus peaking. If you're a camera nerd, it has all that stuff. And you can see also. I'm gonna zoom in a bit on it. Um, you can see at the bottom there it has audio meters, so I can get a sense of what the the sound is like. Um, it's got some, uh, you know, a, a play pause button because it can also record video. You can put in uh, some some media in there and record on that as you're monitoring. Uh, so typically, how you know I would use this day to day is, you know, when I do a piece of camera, you know, filming a, a video review, you know, it just gives me a, a really clear sense of if I'm in focus, uh, what the background looks like, and all that good stuff. But during a live stream. Um, like in this scenario, this is one way I would use it, uh, just checking, you know, critical focus on myself, making sure light's good, that, you know, the audio is bouncing. So just to kind of monitor what's going on. But another interesting way that I've used it in the past is um, you'll see on 
hold on. You'll see on the left there of the, the monitor, there are two HDMI cables. Uh, I, what I've done in the past also is to feed uh, the, the screen from a computer into the video assist. So let's say I'm recording an interview and it's you know done via Zoom. I can still face the camera and, and also look at the guest as well so it's not so disconcerting. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a cheat. I don't think it was intended to do that, but it does make um, kind of a good solution to do that. So pretty cool. Um, it's uh, <laughs> definitely this camera has been a, a workhorse here on the channel. I'm gonna back it up just a bit. Um, and reposition. Oh. Kind of a, a newer acquisition this year is actually this tripod. And I know tripods like the, the least exciting thing I could talk about. But um, as you can tell, like once you start putting things on the camera, it makes it really top heavy. So having good support um, just becomes more essential. And what's cool about this tripod is you know when you if you think about how tripods typically work um it's if, if, if it's a multi-leg tripod you have to go undo like three either levers or twist locks uh, so you're bending over trying to, to set the tripod up this one is cool in that each leg only has one kind of quarter turn lever so really fast to make quick adjustments especially when there's heavy stuff uh, on the tripod, you don't, you don't have to do you know nine legs in total just to adjust the height and bend over and and risk things falling off the camera. So uh, pretty you know good investment if this is something uh, you guys want to do. And this tri tripod in particular, not very expensive. I think you can get the legs for about a hundred for like a hundred bucks. Uh, trust me, I did a really wide search on trying to find a tripod where you can adjust each leg with just one control instead of you know a multi-step leg uh, function. And this one was like the cheapest and it looked like the, the best value. So that's, that's what I went for. Um, so that is the tripod. That's that end of, uh, I guess, the studio. Let me uh, readjust the camera here and you guys can see the controls. <laughs> All right, so you, you can see we have bikes on bikes on bikes. That's Laura's breadwinner in the shot. Again, my handy dandy uh, uh, camcorder remote control. Who said camcorders are dead in 2020? Not, not true, very, still very functional. So there's a lot going on here. It looks very complicated, um, but basically this top part handles all the audio. I've got uh, on this mic here, oops, let me pop myself off. This is uh, Audio-Technica Audio -Technica 2035. Um, it's held up by a stand. The XLR cable runs behind it, and it connects to this thing, which is the Rode Podcaster, uh, or Rodecaster, excuse me. And this has the ability to have uh, four mics. I can feed in computer audio here. Um, I can actually have guest callers. And you know I can play jingles like what you guys were hearing. Uh, so lots of cool functionality. So far, the most I've had is uh, two mics on with Laura and I, but I do have plans in the future to to taking the uh, the video on the road and having multiple guests. So you know when COVID was happening, I figured you know let's invest in some gear that we know that we'll be able to use in the future. Uh, you know make the channel really future proof. Uh, this stuff definitely not uh, cheap, but I think I've been getting a lot of good use out of it. And in terms of the video end, that's where this thing uh, comes in handy. And this is the ATEM Mini Pro. Let me slant the camera down really quickly. All right. Again, magic of Magic of the uh, camcorder. Okay, come on, focus. You can do it. You can see I'm wearing shoes and bedrocks. That's how we roll here. Um, so what this does is it switches the camera views. So I can uh, have multiple cameras and cut to them just by hitting this button. You can see I'll put myself up here. Um, 
So really super, super handy. Um, right now I only have uh, two sources. Um, I've run as much as three before. So usually I don't have another HDMI cable. Otherwise I would show you, but I would use one of the sources as uh, the iPad. So if you've been watching our recent uh, live streams on ACN, where I bring up the web page and talk about it, that's all made possible with this thing. Um, you know, I'll bring that up as a sort as a source and replace my video, but keep my audio coming through it, and then I'll pop myself in a little tiny window. So the streaming software we use doesn't do that natively. It was kind of a, a workaround with all this. Um, so this thing's been super handy. Definitely um, when <laughs> when COVID started this was practically impossible to get a hold of i think the availability of something like this is also you know still pretty low these days uh, prior to using this i was using an elgato cam link so something similar but it's basically um this this little device it looks like a memory stick that you would plug the hdmi from the camera and that would turn convert the the video signal into something that the the computer would read as a webcam. So when I bought that cam link, uh, you know, it was a couple months before COVID happened, I could, you know, it was like 90 bucks. But peak, peak COVID in March, people were, were scalping that thing. Uh, they were selling it for $300, uh, which is just bonkers. Uh, similar with, with this guy. So the A10 Mini by Blackmagic, um, this is a pro version. There's a non-pro version, which, you know, retailed like 300 bucks. People were, were buying this. It was sold out everywhere and they were reselling it for like $600. Um, this one cost a little bit more. I think this was five something. People were, who had this were, were selling this, you know, and, and upselling it like 300, 400 bucks. It's just crazy. Um, you know, but that's, that's just the world we live in. You know, now we're all used to uh, participating in Zoom calls and, and everyone's doing live streams. Um, so... I think that's a, a tour of most of the, the things. I think I'll do a little bit wider shot and you can get a bigger overview. So hold on one second. Oh. All right. So I'm gonna pop myself again. And uh, as you can see, this is kind of the computer. I'm running this all on uh, some software called Ecamm Live. It's Mac specific, and it uh, when you combine the software with you know things like the switcher and the mixer, it just makes for uh, a pretty cool system. Um, definitely the ability to do some really nice high production stuff. Even though, as you guys can tell from the beginning, still very easy to mess up. Um, let's see. So that's, I think that's, that's it for the tour. So if you guys have any questions about any of this gear, uh, just let me know. Um, so T-Track here says, yes, crazy setup. It is definitely a setup that uh, I didn't think I would ever get into, but I think it's a good investment. Um, you know, besides doing live streams, I can use uh, the ATEM to to do um, you know kind of multiple camera angle videos, so a product review where there's a, a piece of camera portion, and then I can cut to you know a different camera with a close up on the product. If you guys saw our live stream with PNW components, I utilized that a bit. Uh, this the Lumix was my A cam, and then I would cut to a close up of the the product uh, with the camcorder. So. Okay, so T-Track asks, what size lenses do you use? So for a locked off shot like this, um, this is a micro four thirds camera. So the lens I'm using is a Sigma 16 millimeter 1.4. So in 35 millimeter terms, that's about a 30, 30 millimeter 1.4. Uh, so it does a, a decent job at, at knocking out the background. It's not as good as a full frame camera. But, you know, at the time when I bought it, that was the best value. And I've just kind of stuck with the Lumix system just because they do a really good job. Um, and yeah, next level tech, but still loose and fun. Uh, that's, what, that's what I aim for. <laughs> um, if you guys watch the early live streams with ACN, um, there were a lot 
of issues. Uh, most of them were on my end because that was when I was acquiring all this gear and trying to figure out the workflow and how to make things work. So lots of audio issues, um, <laughs> lots of echo. You know, that's still a, a sh an issue I, I, I still really um, kind of have to deal with. And yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's still a learning experience. I mean, I did one live stream recently where during the, the pre-flight, everything looked good and sounded good. And the second it went live, I was hearing my own voice delayed. So imagine interviewing someone, trying to, to, to ask good questions and be attentive and run all this while hearing yourself in delay. It was just absolutely maddening. <laughs> um, okay, so Vela Studio, Andy asks, how do you get it all to YouTube? So what happens is uh, the, the ATEM brings in all the video sources and it connects to the, the computer via USB-C and the computer sees all the sources from the ATEM as basically a webcam. So this, in some ways, is a very fancy, uh, like, Logitech uh, camera. And once, once the computer sees that, then you have different options. Some people use uh, OBS, Open Broadcasting System. Um, I've, you know, I just use Zoom on a lot of the, the videos. So in Zoom, I can select the ATEM as, or the Blackmagic uh, ATEM as a, as a webcam, and then connect that um, to the backend YouTube live stream stuff. So I've used Zoom. Currently, on this particular live stream, I'm using Ecamm Live, which is Mac specific, but it's, it's pretty robust and has lots of cool features. For ACN, we use uh, StreamYard. And I've used OBS in the past prior to all that. So uh, depending on the level of interactivity I want with guests, whether or not I want to pull in things um, like, you know, like YouTube comments, it'll really kind of determine what platform, what software I use. But, but there's a lot going on. Uh, let's see. Okay, Brian. Brian asks, how about the lighting? Uh, that's a good question. So I actually wasn't going to do any lighting for the show tonight, but a big storm came through and everything got super dim. So I'll, I'll show you guys what the light looks like. It's really simple uh, on this setup. Okay. All right, so I don't know how much you're going to be able to see uh, because when they pointed it at the light, they, it, it totally got blown out. But basically, uh, I've got one, I use one key light, and it's, whoops, and it is uh, fairly inexpensive for, for what it is. It's by a brand called Falcon Eyes, and it's a, it, it comes in as a, a mat, like a flexible mat of LEDs, which then has kind of a softbox enclosure. Um, so this has kind of some diffusion material, but it also has some, you know, what's called an egg crate, so it's a little bit more directional. So it's not just spilling light, and you can get some contours and shadows and everything. So that's the key light, and it's set to, to tungsten, because typically, uh, if you've watched previous videos where I have a blue light behind me, that's because I set that light to, to daylight, and it looks, it looks blue on camera. Uh, but this is a fairly, set up, fairly simple setup with just one key light uh, set in tungsten. So that is the lighting. Uh, not, not a whole lot to it, but very important, uh, especially when you know a storm comes in and all of a sudden your room becomes super dark. So great question. Um, let's see. So Chris is having a, a post-ride whiskey too. So speaking of whiskey, uh, this is um, it's a Scotch PD1. It's called, uh, I think, Ledag. Le Le um, Pretty good if you like a, a peaty yet balanced uh, scotch. So, so cheers. Um, let's see. Any other questions about this whole setup? Um, so, Doug, it's a light by the brand called Falcon Eyes. They make this kind of flexible LED in many sizes. There's one smaller, one larger. This is the, the middle gold, Goldilocks size. And I found that it works really well for lighting one person. When I've had Laura on as well, it'll do two people. It's a little bit of a stretch. I have to get creative with the, with the placement, but uh, pretty good. 
pretty good light. All right, yeah, fan of Lumix. Lumix, Lumix makes, or Panasonic makes awesome cameras. Um, so Velo Studio asks, is the Cave of Bad Ideas in the same space? And <clears throat> the Cave of Bad Ideas is literally below this space. <laughs> it's, it's quite literally a cave. Um, so we live in a, a weird split level two bedroom and they're really half size bedrooms and it's almost like bunker style. They're, they're below, below grade. So it, it does feel like a cave. Um, it's a lot smaller than this space. So I usually when I film in there, I have to put on a, a wide angle lens adapter or, or shoot really wide with the Lumix to, to make it happen. Um, Le keg, le keg. All right. Yes. Yes. If you're gonna if you're gonna drink whiskey, you know you have to drink it out of a Glencairn glass. Otherwise, you're just a savage or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, these glasses are great. You know they 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 kind of funnel uh, their aromatics into your nose. And as we know, if you're into to food, wine, drink, all that stuff, you know a big portion of what you taste is actually what you smell. And a glass like this is is great for that. And not sponsored, although it would love to be by by Glenn Karen. Um, so T T Track asks, how expensive is Montana? Nobody move here. <laughs> um, in terms of housing, it, it depends. Like we're in Missoula, so it's a university town. It's a little bit more expensive. It's it's almost as expensive, uh, at least the new housing is compared to to like Portland. Not quite California prices, but um, the, the new developments that are popping up, they're asking a pretty penny for, for what they're giving. Um, you know, other than that, it's a college town, so food's fairly cheap. Um, so, I mean, the, the cost of living is, uh, is lower than when we were living in Portland, and it's one of the big reasons that we can go all in on the YouTube channel because we can kind of really cut down our costs. So, all right. Um, so Chris asks, what's my nine to five? My nine to five is I get up <clears throat> usually at seven thirty. uh, first coffee, go for a run breakfast with Laura. And then we do our respective works. Um, usually answer emails, uh, do mailings, you know, all the people that they graciously buy stickers and postcards deal with that. Usually do a post office run mid morning and then, <clears throat> From then on, uh, the day is pretty organic. Like tomorrow, I've got two bike whisper sessions on the calendar. So if you guys don't know, I do bike cons bike consulting. You know, if you have any questions about your perfect bike and are curious about all the bikes I've ridden, gonna help you out with that. So I've got two of those sessions uh, tomorrow, and in between that, I'm filming a roll or the piece to camera for. Um, What's it called? The uh, the bike review on the Atsuwahila Sea, as well as um, the piece to camera for Paul Clampers. So those are the next two kind of hosted videos that are going to be coming out soon. So look for that. And then, you know, honestly, I'll try to get a ride in. Um, when the weather is nice and it's not raining like it is now, I'll go fishing and then you know, later in the evening, it's just planning videos, doing research, writing scripts, all that stuff. So YouTube is a, is a never ending process. <laughs> uh, so Curtis asks, uh, Lex br bluish background and, and warm main light. You see him to have moved away from that. Is that, is there a reason it's laziness? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't feel like setting up a, a second light tonight. And also, you know, it's, it's peak daylight hours. So it takes a lot of light to overcome the, the ambient light. So while it's light like this, I figured I'd, I'd save myself a little bit of work um, and not do like a two light setup. So, so where is the whiskey collection? The whiskey collection is about 10 feet yonder. <laughs> We've got, uh, what do we have there? We've got, I know I have three scotches. What do we have there? So Laura's holding them up. Uh, there's a Ardbeg OA, OA. Uh, there's a Akintoshin. There's a, uh, Laura's got a Pikesville Rye, a High West double rye or single rye? Double, double rye. Uh, 
great stuff if you like rye. Uh, uh, what does that say? Oishi whiskey, so some Japanese whiskey. And gift whiskey from our friend uh, Al, uh, Alexa Box Hill. It's um, a local local rye to her. And what else is there? That's it. That's all. That's it's all worth. That's that's worth mentioning. There's no fireball back there. If that's what you're asking. <laughs> okay. So let's. Uh, what should we talk about next? So that was the studio tour, and um, hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed that. You know, I it does not have to be this complicated, but when I get into things, I really like to go in deep just to make it interesting for me. So that's one of the reasons, you know, we invested in, in this. Um, it just, it, it's fun. It's, fu it's fun for me to do. It's definitely like running a circus because not only do you have to perform to camera, you know, manage the comments, make sure the audio is working, switching cameras, all that stuff, make sure the lighting's okay. Uh, it's a lot for one person, but, you know, part of my brain really likes juggling all those things. So, yeah. Okay. So... So why, why all this live streaming? You know, one of them, one reason was that it was a very practical one. We couldn't travel. We had all this, uh, all these bike trips planned around April or March uh, that just got canceled. So we still had to make content for the channel. So one, one reason was a very practical one. And a second one is just realizing that the world has changed, that, you know, this kind of content is going to become the norm. And I should probably make all my mistakes early, invest in the gear, so once you know people start to adopt it more, we're we're in a good space. So you know, second reason was just thinking ahead, and third reason is, you know, we I keep thinking about what we have to offer. You know, our viewers on YouTube, you know, not the fastest cyclist, not the most epic cyclist, but we know a lot of people. You know, we've been at this for over a decade. We've made some good relationships, and you know, it dawned on me that one of you know the the value or part of the value that we can give to you guys is introducing you to some of the cool people that we know in the industry. Um, you know, having them, you know, of course they're going to be talking from, from their brand perspective, but at least, you know, trying to get a little bit of their personality to come out. So I thought a live stream format would be a great way to do that. I know I did that previously with, you know, the podcast PLP talks, uh, but there was a lot of editing. <laughs> In doing that. So live streaming is a way to have that similar look and feel with, you know, I wouldn't, it's probably less work in terms of just pure man hours, but it's still, it's still definitely work. So, yeah. Um, so that's why the live stream. And also, you know, uh, this, this kind of dovetails into the second point is I've been toying around with the idea of doing various classes. Um, you know, you guys know I'm super into watercolors and, and fly fishing, and I've got all this equipment, and I like explaining things and, and kind of trying to make things more simple. So I'm hoping to use this stuff to do some, you know, uh, like watercolor classes. I know very niche, how to paint your bicycle ride. So look for that soon. And I'll probably do that class as a live stream on Zoom. Um, I've also been toying around with the idea of do of creating a, a Skillshare class on you know the basics of watercolors. Um, you guys know that I only got into it two years ago, but I'm a quick learner. I absorbed a lot of material, so it would be a cool way of distilling all that information into you know kind of really beginner friendly uh, in, in, in a really beginner friendly format. So that's one thing. Another thing I, I, I plan to do with all this stuff. So let me know if you if that's something you guys would be into. Uh, I have not officially scheduled the watercolor class yet, but it'll probably be it will probably be a month out, just so I have enough time to to really create the course, and um, you know create the materials for that. I'm envisioning an hour and a half to two hour live session with a break in between, and the first part will be, you know, gear equipment, you know, like like bikes, you know, watercolor has its own set of tools and then some kind of really basic uh, techniques and then different metaphors to look at watercolor, uh, at, at watercolors to, to make it easier to understand like the process of painting. And then we'll go into um, painting a picture uh, from scratch and I'll t narrate and talk about, you know, why I made certain decisions either in the design of the painting 
um, you know, the values, the colors, the details, all that stuff. So look for that soon. Definitely, definitely a niche. I don't think you'll, you'll see GCN ever do a watercolor tutorial on their channel, but, uh, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> uh, so Sean Gould asks, uh, when did you get interested in fly fishing? Um, for me, it was actually when we were on bike tour, you know, we were doing this big cross country trip and we'd always camp next to water. I'm not much of a swimmer, you know, you can only take so many photos of water and I wanted a different way to interact with the scenery. Um, oftentimes we'd, you know, ride until afternoon and have, you know, all this daylight to kill. So I thought, you know, what better way than to kind of interact with the environment than to, to go fishing, <laughs> you know, cause we'd stop and I'd see all these people fishing and be like, oh, you know, what are they catching? How are they catching it? And it was just this kind of natural curiosity that, that got me into it. Uh, since then, a lot of our choices for, for bike trips uh, has been based on where there's also good fishing. So like, like how we use bike, bikes as a means to explore uh, a region or a destination or a road, you know, fishing is very similar. Oftentimes, you know, the, the purpose for me isn't necessarily to catch fish. You know, that's always a nice after effect. But it's mostly to see where this random gravel road goes to that runs along this beautiful piece of water. So again, a, a means for exploration. Um, so Corey asked, did you do any other forms of art besides photography? Uh, now prior to watercolor photography was the primary one. I mean, I drew a little bit as a kid, but nothing serious as an, as an adult. So, um, yes. <laughs> yes. A supply list, sup supple supply list for the, the watercolor class that will be forthcoming. Um, so yeah, so definitely look for that, uh, some kind of online watercolor course, or if not failing that, you know, I'm going to try to create something on Skillshare. You know, one of the things as, as a YouTuber, I finally come to accept that as a job title is that you need multiple forms of income, right? Cause AdSense goes up and goes up and down, you know, sticker sales can go up and down, you know, Patreon is probably the most consistent thing that we can bank on and kind of plan, um, and you know, just, just plan on, on having. So Skillshare or some kind of online course is, is something that I've not considered until recently. Uh, just need multiple streams to, to keep the show going. Okay. So I think that's all I have in terms of uh, the, the what's and the whys of live streaming. If you guys have any other questions, definitely leave those in the comments. Let's move on to some gear previews. Uh, I'm going to undo my shirt here because... Just because. Um, and I think I'm going to start out with the bags first, just because that, that's going to be the easiest thing to talk about. OK. Uh, so uh, so T-Track, we'll get back into fly fishing very soon. I'm going <laughs> to get into the bags, and then we'll, we'll come back to the fishing. Uh, I'm going to show some cool B-roll as, as I talk about the rod. So this, this bag is by our friends at Reload. Um, you may, uh, if you've been watching the channel, you would have seen our live stream with Roland. Uh, you know, Reload, great company. Roland's been at it for over 20 years, based in Philadelphia. Uh, they're a, a, a supporter of the channel. You know, if you're a Patreon supporter, you get 15% off of uh, their bags, which is pretty cool and uh, generous of him. And I ordered this one because I wanted something a little bit smaller than the Brat Pack and also something a little bit quicker to get into. So this is definitely smaller. And what's nice about this is um, since it's not so wide, it rests in the small of your back really nicely and it feels more transparent when you're riding. And also, um, it's just got a simple Velcro closure. So a little bit quicker to get into. I'm envisioning putting uh, you know, camera gear here or, or snacks on, on day rides. You know, situations where I don't need the full-on brat pack and really value quick access. So pretty simple, <clears throat> nicely made so far as I can tell. Um, and yeah, we'll have a, a review on this forthcoming once I do a couple rides with it. Okay. So, uh, so Guthrie. All right, got some, <laughs> yes. He's making, he's making face masks too. Um, pretty cool guy. 
So Doug says, I'm registered for Ochoco Overlander in September. Any tips? Uh, let's get back to that because Laura and I are still kind of scheduled to go and we'll, we can talk about that a little bit. Okay, so this is, again, from Reload. It's this cool kind of rust and brown color. And this is what they're, I think he calls this officially the kitchen sink. And, you know, it's a, a saddlebag. It goes under your rails. And what's cool about this is that it's not as big as a full-on bikepacking seat bag, but it's definitely much larger than your typical, like, roadie bag. So... You know, I envisioned this for something during the, the shoulder season when you got to carry multiple layers or maybe you want to carry lunch. Um, this is a great bag for that where um, you don't need the full-on bike packing, you know, boner bag that's going to flop all over the place. This is a little bit more self-contained. One nice touch about this is it's got three, three positions here that you can move these, uh, saddle, these saddle straps to. So you can really kind of fine-tune the angle it sits on the rear of your bag, which I thought was kind of nice. So, yeah, pretty stoked on it. Um, have not ridden with this one yet because uh, the bike I'm currently riding has a dropper post and this, this doesn't really work with it yet. So, but soon, but soon. So look for that video soon. Uh, any questions about the reload stuff before we talk about fishing some more? <laughs> uh, okay. Do not lie, people. Okay. So let's move on to this guy. This is, I believe this, this rod's called the First Cast. And it's by a brand called Rayer Gear. And I've been kind of quasi-following this brand for a while. Didn't know if it was too gimmicky or what have you. But then I uh, got to know the, the guy that helps do the marketing with them. And he's like, hey, you want, you want to try it? I was like, sure. You know, I love fishing. I love weird stuff and this is definitely a combination of fishing and weird stuff right <laughs> um it's it's interesting because it's you know a western fly rod it's got a reel it uses uh, you know western style uh, fly line you use the same kind of flies as you would if you're fishing with a regular the western fly rod but it does collapse so I'm not going to undo it because it's going to make a hot mess in the, in the studio here, but it collapses like a Tinkara rod. And I forget the overall length of this. It's, it's pretty short. It's definitely below nine feet. I want to say it's maybe eight feet uh, or seven, six. So a little bit on the stubbier side, this is their four weight. So if you're not familiar with, with fly fishing, you know, rods and lines have different weight classifications. Two weight is really skinny, short, very supple rods made for small water. Twelve weight is, you know, more substantial rod meant to to take into salt water. Five weight is usually in the middle, so this is slightly smaller than than that kind of middle weight. So this is this would be your all rounder rod. This would be the the gravel bike, <laughs> if you will, of the fly fishing world. You can fish smaller wa water with it fairly effectively. Uh, you could also get into slightly bigger water, um, but you'd be underfishing, <laughs> if that's a term. So that's what, uh, yeah. So Sean, yeah, this is uh, this is technically a, a four-weight line, four-weight four rod. Um, let's let's I'll show you guys some some fishing footage, and I'll I'll talk over that because that should be a little bit more interesting. So this is me uh, walking out, strutting out there with a. Uh, with with the rod and you can tell i was moving at a, a brisk pace because there are other anglers getting to the water and this is actually where i think this rod really excelled because if this were like a traditional four or five piece i'd have to stop you know put put the segments together attach the reel pull out the line but here i could sprint out to where i wanted to be and kind of undo this uh, you can see here the way that it unfolds is kind of interesting. So it's got six sections uh, total, and you want to undo the second largest one and stop, and then pull out the tip and follow from there. So it's, I find that, you know, it's not, it wasn't as intuitive as a Tinkar rod, but not, not to say that it's complicated. It's just there's a, a distinct series of steps you have to follow. 
uh, to, to pull it out and to, to uh, collapse it without breaking it. Otherwise, it's, it's too easy to break. So this is me uh, fishing the local water. And I think this, is, this would have been the second time that I'd fished with this. And one thing that's interesting is if you look at the rod, there's no, there's no guides for the line. So typically, you know, a, a, a spinner rod or even, you know, Western rod, there are guides, right, that hold the line through, just those little uh, metal curly cues. And this rod doesn't have that, doesn't, doesn't have that. The, the line actually goes inside the rod and is in the kind of the cap, the, the central cavity of the rod and pops out the top where there's one single ferrule, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there's me catching and losing or hooking and, and losing a fish. And what's, what's neat though, is that there is like one hole down here which kind of acts as a stripper guide. So if you're, if you know anything about fly fishing, you know when you set the hook, you have to pull the line and and lift the rod up. So you can do that with this. Uh, you can also double haul with this. Uh, I found, however, that there's slightly more drag and friction uh, doing those kinds of things, just because it's it's going inside the the cavity of the the rod and not through guides. Um, so you definitely have to adjust. So yeah, <laughs> Doug Moore says inter internal routing, right? That's what we need. We need internal routing for our fly rods. Um, so it, it's it's a unique system, and I will say this: some people have asked if this would make a good beginner set, and I don't know. I I don't think it, it would actually. <laughs> I think a Tinkara setup would be much more beginner friendly because there's less line management. This rod makes a lot more sense if you kind of have the the mechanics of casting already down, um, kind of know what you're doing, but just want something in a smaller package. I feel like this might be kind of a, a tricky rod to learn on for your first time, just because it, it is so different from other uh, Western rods in terms of uh, resistance and just the feedback it gives you. Um, so I would say that this, you know, at least for me, I, I think this, this would be, would fare better in the hands of, of someone that's already been into fishing for a while and just wants a really compact tool. Um, but it, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's definitely faster to de deploy than, uh, my, my, my Reddington travel rod, uh, or any rod that I have. Um, so it does, it does fulfill on the promise of being as convenient as a Tinkara rod insofar as it telescopes and you don't have to assemble segments and all that stuff, uh, but gives you, you know, all the kind of control you would want from a, a Western fly rod. Uh, if you're super into fishing, then, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> then, you know, you know, there's different line maneuvers, line management that you have to do aside from just casting. That's one aspect of it. Um, you also have to do things like uh, mending the line. So let's say there's different speed currents. You want to toss a little loop so your fly is floating in, in the current that you want. Uh, you're able to do that with this rod. Again, you're limited by its relatively short length, but it can do those kind of fishy maneuvers. So uh, <clears throat> Ben C, yes, I am familiar with Tenkara. Um, did you know? <laughs> When we were on our tour back in 09, uh, we actually got into communications with Daniel uh, from Tinkara USA, who is probably the first US importer of Tinkara rods. And he sent us over a rod to take with me on uh, that, that bike tour. So people always ask about, do you, do you know, have you heard of Tinkara? It's like, yes, we have <laughs> for over a decade. Um, so, and Daniel's a cool guy. You know, I give Daniel mad props because I know. When he introduced, you know, Tenkara into the U.S., he got a lot of flack from 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 the fly fishing industry. If you think that, if you think the the cycling industry is full of traditionalists, you know, the fly fishing industry is a whole other league. So uh, people gave him a lot of crap. You know, called it a fad that it would never catch on, that it wasn't real fly fishing, that uh, it was dapping. So you know, it's, the language sounds familiar, but he stuck with it. You know, and since then, you know, it's grown. Patagonia started their own kind of Tinkara line. Um, you know, 
Who else is there? Um, yeah, there's many other brands have. Uh, so you know, good on Daniel for 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 bringing it to market and kind of combating that early resistance. So let's see. So do you guys have any questions about this gear while I have it out here? Um, trying to go back. So Sean says um, he has a 5.6 uh, in the seven piece. Yes, it can be a pain in the butt to set up every single time. This is definitely a faster solution. And one thing that struck me is that this thing is like remarkably small. You know, this would easily fit in any backpack. Uh, you know, probably a, a full-size painter. Um, you could probably strap this down to a saddlebag, if that's how you roll. So definitely compact, nice and compact. Matt Ford looks pretty tucked. Yes, it's a, it's the most tucked rod I've ever I've ever tried. So Don asks, any comments on quality? So, I mean, the reel's nice. Um, you know, it's hard to say. Like, like one of, I mean, the cork feels good. I mean, it feels like any kind of standard uh, Western fly fishing rod. Um, you know, it's probably not the same finish as like a uber fancy bamboo rod or something like that. But again, the, the price point isn't there. Uh, it's a good, it's, it's more of, it's more of a tool rod, I would say, than, than something, uh, just to be, to be fondled. So I definitely appreciate that. I mean, the real seat, you know, it feels solid, you know, the, this, this locks pretty good. It's nice and positive. Haven't had any problems with the, the drag. I mean, it's, you know. I think for, for the price of what they're asking, it's definitely par with what's out there at that price point. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a good tool rod. So let's see. So Ben C says, you reviewed a Tinkara pack made by my friend once. Who's your friend? Is it the Yona packs guy? Because his, uh, his bags are awesome. <laughs> That's one of my favorite uh, fishing hit bags at the moment. Okay, yeah, Yonapax. Yeah, if you guys aren't familiar, Yonapax, um, I know he shut down production for, for a bit, but his, he does them right. He's got lots of nice features on them. He's got integrated um, kind of tippet spool holder, which is you know, really simply and elegantly done with just a piece of cordage. You can change that pack from a hip bag to a, a semi-sling pack. Um, let me see if I can bring up the website here. So you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, and he, he had stopped production for a while. Okay. So hopefully you are seeing the Unipax. Okay. So this is uh, Unipax. Um, I'll zoom in here. And you can see it's got all sorts of uh, places to dangle things, right? If you thought cyclists dangled a lot, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can get your dangle on uh, fly fishing. So mo molly strap, uh, molly straps here for for mounting stuff. Uh, you know, good quality zippers. Uh, there's a little loops here for, for putting on your nippers and everything. Um, he also makes these really small guys. If you're super minimal and in, into uh, Tinkara, I'm not that minimal. <laughs> and he's based in Gainesville, Georgia. So a uh, cool, cool bag company uh, for fishing stuff. Um, oh, one thing here. So I don't know if you guys can see, but these, these webbing straps here, they're actually loops. So these are designed to carry a rod tube. Uh, but you can also put a jacket there. You know, I've used it to hold a water bottle when I'm on the when I'm on the river. So, pretty pretty versatile stuff. Um, I would show it to you if uh, if I wasn't <laughs> if I had the bag handy. It's actually in in the van right now. I, I use it so much. Um, it's definitely my my go-to fishing bag. Right, C. Johnson. <laughs> Ever realize you needed more POV fly fishing videos in my life? 
Yeah. <clears throat> if I had infinite time, I would do just a, a fly fishing ASMR channel, which is just just some 360 footage staying in the river fishing. <laughs> okay. So any other questions while I've got all this set up? I think I still have a second camera view. Um, you can see, by the way, it's all bikes here. So that's my Bambora, Laura's um, cutthroat with alt bars, and then over there was uh, her breadwinner. <laughs> so her place right now is mostly, mostly bikes, as always. Um, <clears throat> so Vela Obscura, I can't make my mind on the 4.6 weight. I would say the... I mean, it depends on where you live, right? So in Montana, the four weight makes the most sense. In the Pacific Northwest, like Oregon, maybe use it as a as a light, um, a very light uh, steelhead rod. Although I think, although I think it, it might be a little too light for for steelhead rod, even at, uh, even at a six weight. So I would go with the four. I think that makes the most the, the best all rounder. Um, so Michael asks, how would you go attaching a four-piece rod to your bike? So if it's in a rod tube, you can just strap it to a painter or transverse across a saddlebag. Um, assembled, usually, you know, if depending on the water, sometimes I'll just ride within my hand. If it's like a super quiet gravel road and there's not too many crazy clients, I'll just ride one-handed. Uh, there is a way to kind of... Uh, keep it strung up, but broken down into sections. Maybe I'll make a video on that in the future. But basically, you 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 undo the segments, but keep the line there and, and wrap it around in a certain way, and use a Velcro strap, and that keeps it mostly attached. So, but it, it, it's tricky to do. So, what kind of van do we have? We have a 2006 uh, Tier of the Sienna. So, nothing fancy. Uh, bought it used in Portland, but it's awesome adventure mobile. Uh, T track, how many bikes do you own now? I'm actually not sure. You know, I just sold three of them, so <laughs> we're going n minus three uh, so far. So, what is a more expensive hobby, cycling or fishing? Uh, I think. Bikes might be at the beginning, but fishing can certainly catch up. Because if you think about it, there's the rod. Let's say a decent setup, something like this. This costs 250, which is actually, I know it sounds like a lot for not fishing, but trust me, that's that's pretty good value. Um, you know, there are fly fly rods that, that cost anywhere from like 400 to 1,000 bucks, and that's without the reel, a line, or anything. So just like any hobby, it can get very expensive very quickly. But you know. Like cycling, there's fishing-specific clothing. So, you know, if you want to go wading, there's boots. That's probably, you know, 100, 200 bucks. There's waders, again, you know, 100 to 300 dollars. Um, what else? There's all the the kind of the doodads, the tools, and the flies. That's easily another 100 bucks. Um, fishing license <clears throat> and travel. You know, so it can it can rack up pretty quickly. So, yes, bikes, fishing, whiskey are all potentially very expensive. Yes. <laughs> I would agree. Whiskey is very expensive, actually. <laughs> so, got three. Regarding selling, making good on your sentiments regarding... Uh, no, actually, I'm just... We're, we're paring down. You know, I looked at her stable... And there was a lot of redundancy in the bikes. So the bikes I sold were um, my Warbird, just because I, f I, felt, I felt like I was too close to the Bambora. And if I had to choose between the two, I would choose the Bambora, mostly because of the steel fork. And then we sold Laura's Warbird because she's got a breadwinner, which, you know, again, similar reasons. And then I sold my Cutthroat. Um, you know, it was a bike that, I like, but didn't really love. Uh, we kept Laura's Cutthroat and converted it to an alt bar bike, and she loves that now. 
So it's just a matter of kind of paring things down to um, so we don't have overly redundant bikes. So Don asked, do I tie my own flies? Yes. Uh, I'm going to back up here. So you probably can't see that, that very blurry thing in the background, but that's uh, my, my vise, and there's some feathers hung up, and below that is, is some shelving with all the other kind of materials I need to, to tie flies. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty gratifying to be able to, to think of a pattern, tie it, and then we live, I don't know, maybe a block away from a little creek that holds trout and then catch fish there um, <coughs> all, all within like an hour. So that's pretty cool. So fellow studio asks, now that Laura's uh, full time with me and PLP, what's her plans to dominate over GCN? Um, <laughs> yes, it's a good question, huh? <laughs> so Laura's off camera laughing. Um, I don't know. You know, we, you know, if you're if you're on our Discord, there was a, a, a lively discussion about where GCN and PLP fit in, and you know, for the record, you know, I don't have anything against GCN. I like I like to poke fun. They make good content. But at the same time, I don't think they represent all cyclists. You know, they're very much, you know, status quo, uh, kind of, you know, mainstream industry. And I think there's a lot of, you know, other types of cycling that aren't represented, uh, that don't have content, that don't have teams, that don't get sponsored. And that's really what our channel is about is, you know, uh, I think in the tagline or something, uh, or, our tra or our channel trailer, it talk about the, the misfits of bicycling. So these are, you know, all the cyclists, uh, and which I feel like there are a lot more of us. We just don't all wear, you know, matching jerseys or anything uh, that don't have a voice. And that's that's where, you know, that's that's been the focus of the channel. So make more make more content around that. Um, you know, we did a, a string of content around clothing, just because I think that doesn't get addressed very much. You know, you know, you'll, you'll see Phil Gaiman or or GCN say you can wear whatever you like. You know, while they're wearing full kit and they don't offer an alternative. So I was getting really frustrated with that uh, because they're just paying at lip service. And I wanted to, to show, yes, there are advantages. There are, there are specific things you should look for. Um, you know, so just, just providing a, a foil to kind of that, that, that style of cycling content. Um, what else do we have planned? Um, I think one thing that we do pretty well uh, over GCN is having the discussions with, with people from different brands. Um, you know, we, like, we are not sponsored. Um, so when you see a bike reviewed, we don't get paid to review that bike. The bike gets shipped back unless, you know, I talk Laura into letting me buy it. Um, and whereas, you know, tr channels like GCN, you know, granted they don't call what they do reviews or more like presentations. Um, so I feel like we're in a unique position where, you know, we, we know enough or we know a fair amount of people in the industry can bring them on and talk candidly about things. Um, and I feel like they're more open to doing that because there's no money changing hands. Uh, so that's, that's something, you know, as long as we're able uh, to, to stick to our guns, that's, that's one thing that we're going to try to do. So... Um, what else? So T Track asked, "Do you expect all this would happen to you and blow up as much as you did?" Uh, I don't know. Are we blown up? <laughs> I feel like in the spectrum of, of cycling channels, we're fairly small, and our growth has been always pretty small. Like we don't, you know, none of our videos are designed as such to have massive growth. Like we don't do, you know, viral style videos. It's I try to keep things informative. Um, so, and, and because of those content decisions, it's always going to be kind of a trickle. But my hope is that even though it's a trickle, people will stick around because they, they get actual value from it. It's not like, you know, um, like you see interesting train wreck and that makes you stop and s hit subscribe. But then after that, you're not engaged. Um, I'd like to think that we provide content that keeps people engaged all the time. So at least that's the goal. <laughs> um, That's true. GCM won't have POV fly fishing videos. No. But if they do a video on bike fishing, you know where they got the idea from. <laughs> uh, 
it is kind of interesting times because I feel like, you know, with the, especially with the ACN crew, we're pretty small and mobile. So we can, you know, latch on or talk about uh, trending things a lot quicker than GCN that has like a, a larger editorial team. Um, so in that way, we, we, we can scoop GCN on, on many occasions. Uh, what video has been your biggest hit? Um, of the recent ones, the, the your, your Tires Are Lying to You video with uh, Josh from Silco was a surprising hit. I mean, for a 30-minute video or however long it was on talking about tire pressure. Um, our SRAM derailleur hacks video uh, did pretty well. Um, <laughs> for something that was not sanctioned by SRAM. And you know, that's, that's another bit of like editorial freedom that we can do because we're not taking industry money. It's like we can make, we can make goofy things. Um, otherwise, you know, it might be that because we're sponsored by someone, all of a sudden we can't make certain kinds of content. And you know, that's not the, that's not the reason why, why I do this channel. You know, a lot of it's because of, of creative freedom, you know, doing things like watercolors on the channel or, or fly fishing. Um, <clears throat> So, Velo, so Andy asks, what is the biggest thing you learned in your PLP journey? Uh, I think the biggest thing we learned, or that I learned personally, was kind of understanding what my relationship to cycling is, like where I fit in the spectrum, and then how to communicate that to YouTube and find other people that, that, are, <clears throat> that are drawn to it. Um, you know, because we... You know, we started bike touring, but that's not what that's not we what we do these days. You know, we 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 dabbled in events with like Dirty Kanza, the Montana Gravel Challenge, but that's not really our identity. So for a long time, we were stuck in this place where we love bikes, we're super enthusiastic, but we we have no home. <laughs> there is no there is no place for us in the in the bike industry. But then I got to thinking, you know, if that's how we feel. There's got to be others like that. So how do you kind of distill, um, how, how do you distill that into content? How do you give that a name? And how do you attract other cyclists that, that fall in the same bo boat? You know, I, in some ways I think it's much easier to just be a pure mountain biker or a pure competitive cyclist um, because the distinctions are pretty clear. You know, people know where, where, they, where they're gonna find that content. But that big middle ground, that's a little bit nebulous, hard to pin down. But I think there's a lot of us. You know, that's, you know, the biggest thing I've learned is trying to digest that information and trying to communicate it and attract other cyclists like that. So, um, yes, so Gary says 100K is fast approaching. <laughs> yeah, we've been toying around with the idea of doing a live countdown if it times right. I don't know. We'll see. It's fast approaching, but it's also, it's, it's like watching a very, very slow boat in the distance, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, honestly, I thought when we hit 50,000 that it would just kind of snowball and the growth would be exponential, but reality is it's, it's been pretty slow for us. So when that day finally comes, I'll be a happy person. <laughs> I think for me, that would be um, kind of the equivalent of completing Dirty Kanza uh, creati uh, creatively. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward uh, to that day. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so Bill asks, <clears throat> are there any plans for bikepacking content with ACN? Uh, yeah. So. When we do the ACN shows, like we'll we'll all hang out for another like hour or so, um, kind of loosely talking about plans. And one of the things that keeps coming up is you know doing a joint project. So either going to an event like Sea Otter or Grinduro, and you know as a as a team as a squad, <clears throat> loose association of folks writing together and making videos about it. So. Whether that that would look like a bike packing trip or not, we don't know. But we do we do know that we want it. We want to, you know, get together at some time, actually meet in person and create some content together. So Brian asks, uh, 
as the channel grows, do you have uh, you see yourself having to move? Um, we we're just talking about that today. You know, one of the, the challenges of of this space <laughs> is that it's our living room, right? So after this is done, I've got to put away the light, you know, put away the camera, put all this stuff, move it back to the computer, and you know, it's it's kind of a pain in the butt. So it'd be nice to have one place where I can set everything up, set it and forget it, just show up and start making videos. I think it would speed the whole workflow up, um, have more content on the channel, all that stuff. So maybe one day, but but we shall see. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So has ACN met in person? ACN has not met in person. The closest was the last uh, sea otter. Both Mike and I were there um, the same time, but we just managed to never cross paths. So that, which was kind of a bummer. Uh, but you know, we we were talking about you know sea otter this year, but we'll see if it actually happens. Um, so Velo Studio asks, if money wasn't a project, what show or series would you do? Um, you know, like I love, you know, one of my favorite shows of all time was, was No no Reservations. I'd love to do a, a bicycling version of that. So again, using the the bicycle as the means or as an excuse to go to a place and explore and intertwine, you know, conversations with locals, uh, some historical context, um, yeah, so it would be a, a travel series like show um, that has cycling as kind of maybe the the primary mover, but not the only uh, reason to watch. So, and that would take a lot of money to do, right? Because I wouldn't want to film it and edit it and all that stuff. Um, so we <clears throat> need resources to to one travel and hopefully get like a small crew together. So. Uh, Michael Beyer, what's your biggest gripe when it comes to bike packing bags? So my biggest gripe is that you need so many of them. <laughs> you know, it used to be if if you were re using panniers, you could just use two big ones, but with bike packing, it's like you need like twelve small ones. It's expensive. So one's the cost. Uh, one's the cost per volume. When you do the math, like bike packing bags are very expensive for how much they can carry. And the bags isn't is it's not the end end of the of the problem. Like you most likely have to get ultralight camping gear to make it fit. So it's it's really expensive. And one thing I don't like to to my understanding, like the whole bike packing bag thing came out of, you know, kind of endurance racing. So it's been strange to see it so so widely adopted for for all you know, general bike off-road touring. Um so for, for me, I've tried, just didn't stick, couldn't gel with it. You've probably noticed that there have been fewer bikepacking bag reviews. You know, I put out a, a video a couple of months ago um, talking about, you know, being tired of sausage bags. I'd rather just use like a big Caradice. And I think since then, I haven't reviewed another bikepacking uh, bag since. So, all right. So we are at... An hour and 10 minutes, not counting the first five minutes, which got screwed up, but I will cut that out in the edit. And no one will be the wiser except for you who have watched this live stream. So if you guys like this content, give it a thumbs up. Uh, help spread the channel, all that good stuff. Maybe we'll get to 100,000 a little bit quicker uh, than, than what the internet predicts. So yeah, uh, hope you guys enjoyed spending some time together. Uh, and that you got a, a kick out of the studio tour. Uh, thanks again to the Patreon supporters that really make this content possible. You know, out of all the different ways um, we have to, to cobble an income, uh, you know, Patreon's been you know a lifesaver because you know we we can we can bank on <laughs> having food to eat and rent, uh, and you know, investing in in gear and and knowing that there's gonna be a pool of resources that we can use to help kind of grow the channel. So thanks again to you guys. And if you guys are, are on the fence, I think, did you put that public post up? Oh yeah. Oh. Uh, 
if you're on the fence, there will be a post going up on the Patreon page that talks about all the benefits, of which there are many. So, you know, 15% off of, you know, reload, shoot, reload bags. Um, there's a deal on Ortlieb stuff. Uh, Swift Industries, you know, gives a discount to Patreon supporters, Velo Orange, Soma. So, but my goal is that if you do sign up on Patreon, you're, you're doing it to help support the channel. You're, you're into our message and you want to see it grow. And that, you know, the, the discounts are just, a, you know, icing on the cake. <laughs> you know, it's, it's cool if you, you, you know, you want to sign up and just get the codes. But uh, my hope really is that, you know, you, you, you want to support the channel and, and have kind of this voice of cycling grow. Um, you know, I was talking about GCN earlier. It definitely uh, largest cycling channel on the internet. And if you look at what's after them, you get things like Bike Radar, which is kind of like GCN light. And then, you know, it, it, but it essentially covers the same kind of cycling. I feel like this alternative cycling, whatever you want to call it, you know, party pace, supple life is underrepresented, even though there are lots of us. And that's really what, you know, all this, all the resources come together to, to, to keep uh, spreading this message and get other people stoked. So, um, yeah, uh, with all that said, I hope you guys enjoyed this live stream. <laughs> Thanks for sticking it out. It's an hour and 13 minutes. <laughs> and as always, keep the supple side down.